Jonas Himmelstrand is a business consultant, author, and the founder of Sweden's Morea Institute, whose stated goal is to make available the knowledge about the potential in close relationships to build welfare, development, and democracy. Jonas has long been critical of what has been described as the myth of Sweden as a social utopia based on its much vaunted daycare system. He has given talks in numerous countries on this issue, as well as his belief in the importance of attachment in early human development. Jonas is also the chair of the Swedish Homeschooling Association and has been endeavouring to homeschool his own children for several years, while meeting severe resistance from the local authorities who have responsibility for this area in Sweden. Jonas is currently living in exile in a Swedish-speaking area of Finland. I caught up with Jonas as he spoke to the La Leche League Ireland conference in Sligo in early March of 2012. I started off by asking Jonas his reasons for leaving Sweden. It was a long development. We had a three and a half year conflict with our local government about home education. And this autumn, our son, who was seven, also became of school age. And we applied for permission to homeschool like we've done with our daughter. And we were reported to the social authorities uh, would seem like just pure harassment. And um, I did go to the meeting uh, with the social authorities and asked them quite openly, can you guarantee the safety of our children if we continue to homeschool here, even in this conflict? And they told me that, no, there's no way we can ever give such a guarantee. And uh, the, the woman at the meeting, I asked her directly, she was in effect saying that if we want to be safe homeschooling, we have to go and live in another country. She said, yes. And she said, you know, we don't have any uh, negative opinions about homeschooling. It's not our area, but, you know, we know how we work, and that's how the situation is. So, of course, that's made us a bit concerned. Then a month later, uh, our local government political board decided that they were going to court to appeal for a 20,000 euro fine for homeschooling our daughter for one year. 10,000 euros each for me and my wife. And that was scary, of course, because that would be, you know, financially ruining our family. And it was very hard to understand how intelligent, hopefully empathetic people could just make such a decision, especially as they denied even meeting us. We had been asking for years to have a meeting, just, just have a talk, you know. We'll listen to you for 30 minutes, so you listen to us for 30 minutes, no decisions has to be made, you know, just, just, just to get a communication going. We were always refused that. So then I wrote a, a letter back to, to the politician in, in power here and asked her, are you seriously considering ruining a good family for the sake of a political principle, which is also not uncontroversial? And we're not going to let ourselves be destroyed. We will leave the country. But I want an answer from you if this is really your intention. We didn't get an answer to the letter, but two weeks later we got a, another letter that they want another 10,000 euro fine for the next school year. So then we kind of felt, I'm, I'm the president of the Swedish Home Educators, I know a lot of what happens to families when the social authorities get involved. Swedish social authorities are not always competent, but they're always powerful. And obviously the local government had no feelings about, about you know, understanding or empathizing with us in any way. So we thought, this is the time to leave. We can leave now. We're still safe. This is the time. We don't know what their intentions are. Added to this was also that the amount of 20,000 euros was almost 10 times higher than I'd heard from any other family in Sweden. So it was obvious they were out for us for some reason. And the only reason I could think of was me being active in, in the Swedish Homeschooling Association and me traveling around the world being critical of Swedish family policy. So it seemed like a good time to go, and we were just not simply feeling safe anymore. It was affecting us, so we left quietly and silently, not telling anyone until we were outside the country. And when you say safe, uh, do you mean that in a financial sense? You asked the authorities, would you be safe sending your children or having your children homeschool? No, I mean safe in the sense of not, not getting you know, any in interferences from social authorities or getting a fine being so high that they can send it. I mean, we didn't know what they were going to do. And obviously, we were kind of the first family they were trying things out on. Maybe they were trying something out we couldn't even imagine. But we were not going to be waiting for that. We were going to leave before that happened. And we, I don't know that something would have happened, but I think it's, it's the lack of empathy in you know, asking for a fine they know the family cannot pay. That makes you scared, and especially if they refuse to talk to you. That together means that it's a situation that could become dangerous. 
and we were not comfortable simply. Yeah, so, so that's why we left. And we still held out for three and a half years doing what could be quoted illegal homeschooling. So are you considered a criminal in Sweden at present? No, not a criminal. I, this is not a criminal law. Um, I don't think anybody would say that you're a criminal, but Sweden has, different from most democracies, it does not have a learning obligation, it has a school obligation. And homeschooling is the exception. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, that this huge big fine is all about uh, the old school law, which was the law text, which actually pretty permissive towards homeschooling, if it's interpreted in a correct way. Uh, but um, so, you know, the, 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 the laws about fines say that the fine should be carefully met according to, you know, what's reasonable in, it, in, in those situations, and neither the local government nor the court seem to have paid any attention to that. They seem to be just downright angry that we are not doing what they say. And it seems to be this, this untempered anger from the authority side that makes you uncomfortable about staying in the country. Has homeschooling always been forbidden in Sweden, or is it a recent change of policy? Well, you know, according to the law, Sweden is not, uh, homeschooling is not forbidden in Sweden. I mean, the old law was quite permissive. It said that, you know, uh, parents shall be given the right to uh, teach their children in other ways than said in this law if they provide a fully satisfactory alternative and if they allow oversight from the authorities. Now, knowing what the research on homeschooling says, that should not be difficult to get permission. But that's the permission we've been denied for three and a half years. The new law adds, and not just one more thing to that, there has to be exceptional circumstances. Now, what does that mean? Now, the lawyers we've asked, they say that exceptional circumstances, that's legal fine print for never allowed. So, in effect, one doesn't want to say that one is breaking international conventions, so one has this, this kind of legal fine print, but in effect, it seems to be forbidden now. And I only know of one family in some very special situation who's actually got permission. It seems that everyone else is turned down, and our local governments are basically afraid to go against the national government and the intentions of the new law because it's clearly expressed that they want to stop home education. That's what our Minister of Education has clearly, clearly said. He says there's no way families can ever provide something uh, as good as school can provide. And then you have to know the Swedish schools are not terribly good. And we have provided the Minister of Education with uh, all, the, all the studies and all the data about, about home education, so he knows it, but he obviously has not read it or chosen not to take it in. In Ireland, we have uh, a registration policy with the government, uh, the, the department of the government that runs the truancy, child truancy section. Is there anything like that in Sweden? Did you have to register when, when homeschooling was an option? Well, the Swedish law says you have to apply for permission. It's not about registering. You have to apply for permission. So what happened under the old law and under the new law is that before the school year starts, you have to write to... Uh, uh, to ask for permission from the local authorities. And typically they say no. But you feel that, listen, uh, the way we see the law, we have a right to do this. So you appeal. And you continue to homeschool. So you appeal to the first court, and then they say no. And then you can appeal to the second. And the whole appeals process takes more than a school year. So that's how many people have actually homeschooled in spite of this, because they're in a way waiting to wear the government out and see if they will not understand this at all. And I think that's been the hope of many, that the government would eventually realize that this is not something that can be stopped. And most researchers on homeschooling say it's much better to allow homeschooling demanding oversight than not to allow it. And the Swedish government has unfortunately chosen not to do it that way. So you're the chair of the Swedish Homeschooling Association. How many families do you represent? Uh, and do you know if there are a lot of underground homeschooling families at present? Well, RU has got about 100 members, and I do think that most Swedish homeschoolers are members of, of RUHUS. Um, we are all together. There are no different organizations. We are very united in Sweden. Then there are people who just simply do not want to reveal their addresses or anything in Sweden. So, I mean, they will probably choose not to be members 
in that sense. But it's difficult to be underground in Sweden because in Sweden everyone has a personal number that you're given at birth and that is registered where you live. So the local authorities will just simply look at the list of how many children are seven years of age this year. They should be in school. And if that number is not registered in any school, then they will start to try and track you down. So this thing about trying to pursue, to track down, I mean, Swedish authorities don't have to do that because they basically know everything about everybody, unless you're living in a secret address or something like that, that they can't track you down. But I mean, uh, they, they've been very hard on truancy this year, and, and homeschooling is, from the standpoint of authorities, unless you have permission, it's just another truancy. So one doesn't make a difference between a homeschooling family doing planned education uh, in, of, of high quality and a family who just don't manage their children. They're kind of treated as equal, which is, which is of course, a problem. Sorry, how many families did you say you represent? Well, how many families? We've got 100 members, uh, and so not all of them are homeschoolers. So I would say that, you know, very, you could say there were about 50 homeschooling families in Sweden before the new law took effect. So we probably have most of those, and we have uh, some supporters which are not homeschooling, but which are opposing the cause. So before the new law took effect, one estimated there were about 100 homeschooled children in Sweden from about 50 families. And we know that 10, 12 families have left Sweden in the last year. So it's probably gone down to 40 families. But then there are families who just don't simply want to say anything because they're, they're basically afraid. They're basically afraid. And how many homeschooling children would you think are left in, in Sweden right now? Well, again, there's people who are not going to notify us, but looking at seeing that, we definitely know that 25 children have left in the last year, so that would make 75 left. So I would guess there's something like 50 or 60, and I would say that I know perhaps about a dozen who are actively still uh, opposing the, the, the new law and, and trying to work it through legally. So it's a very, very small amount of people who have been homeschooling in Sweden, and there's never been more than about 100 children which has to be seen in the light that this is a nearly 10 million people country. So this is very small compared to Ireland or or England or basically any other country. It's only Germany where homeschooling is outright forbidden that has the same low amount of homeschoolers as Sweden. Is there much support for the cause of homeschooling in, in Sweden at the moment? Well, that depends where you ask. I mean, the, 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 uh, the new school law has basically been passed with the agreements of all parties in the current coalition. So they kind of bind themselves up for being restrictive about homeschooling, although there's maybe one party who is not so happy about that. Uh, the opposition, there's no support for homeschooling there, really. So basically, there's no support in parliament for homeschooling at the moment. Then I would say that media has been rather kind to homeschooling when it comes to interviewing homeschooling families, making a home visit and showing what it's like. And I think to to some extent that's created a certain interest because, of course, visiting in a homeschooling family is quite experience for for a a grown-up who's never seen it before because they see socially very able children. They see children who've learned in depth, who understand things better than in school. And basically, many journalists simply don't want to leave because they think the energy of coming to a homeschool family is so fascinating. And the children are so open and so willing to talk to adults. I mean, th- they are amazed. And they usually give an expression of that in the re- report in media. So I would say that there is some support in media in that way. There's not so much support, however, when it comes to reporting about the, the, the legal situation or the political situation. Why do you think that is? Well... Swedish media tends to want to support certain government policies, and they think that the school obligation, gender equality, daycare are such good things that everybody should support, and they just don't write about it. It could also be that this is our sensitive subjects to people, because, of course, there are many, many Swedish families who are dissatisfied with school. So it's a sensitive subject, and somehow uh, Swedish media don't have that, that courage to, to uh, be openly expressing about everything, unfortunately. 
Is there any chance of reverting your personal situation and that of homeschooling in Sweden? I mean, do you think that there's a chance of you being able to go home and, and homeschool as you would like? Unfortunately, I think it's going to have to get worse before it gets better. I think it's going to have to become much more public what a form of oppression, harassment and humiliation the Swedish government is now doing to homeschoolers. That has to become more public both in Sweden and internationally before something is going to happen. And of course, eventually we will win because homeschooling is a, is a great educational alternative and Sweden is quite alone in doing this. It's a bit uncomfortable for Sweden to say the truth is that, that um, home education was made illegal in Germany in 1938 and it was made illegal in Sweden in 2011. I mean, that's, that's uncomfortable for the Swedish government. And um, so I do think the situation will change, but I don't think it's going to do it yet. Are you drawing a comparison with the Nazi regime? <laughs> I didn't say that. I just said it was uh, in Germany in 1938. I don't need to say more than that. Okay. <laughs> uh, why are you addressing the La Leche League conference this weekend? Well, I've... I've toured the world quite extensively last year and spoken on the basis of my book on, on an, explaining why the Swedish family policies do not work. And basically our daycare system, which is of course a much bigger challenge for Sweden, the homeschooling situation can be seen as the top of an iceberg of a country which do not acknowledge family, do not acknowledge parenthood, does not really acknowledge motherhood, but would basically like all children from one year of age to be in daycare in school, preschool care, after school care, and basically be cared and educated by the government until late in years of age. So that uh, being here is part of a much, much bigger problem, which is more, involves more Swedes, which is the daycare situation where people, although it's not compulsory, it's almost culturally and financially made nearly compulsory because it's such a strong push for parents to put their children in, in daycare. So that's what I've spoken about in nine cities in, in eight countries last year about, and this is just one more of those presentations I'm giving here. And I'm very happy to be invited to talk about it in Ireland. Is the Swedish government proposing uh, obligatory preschool from the age of three? Do they read that? Well, n no person from the government has actually said this, but you have several politicians basically talking in that direction. And of course, you have to see the fact that the new school law says that, you know, uh, the, the schooling, the educational situation in Sweden is counted from one year of age till 18 years of age. So one is kind of almost waiting for, you know, the day that they will say, it's like, well, you know, this is so good now that we have to make it, you know, compulsory. And there have been some politicians who have openly said that they want to make it compulsory, and the argument often goes to the line that they say that daycare is a right that every child has, and parents should not be allowed to interfere with every child's right to daycare. So that's how one is actually twisting the whole United UN Convention on the Rights of the Child around to try to make it that it is, is a daycare is something better than parents, which is the presupposition, which is a wrong presupposition. But does the Swedish government not recognize the parents' right to have their child at home? Well, they do now, and they will not deny it now, but then you have to see the reality. is like if you want to take care of your own child at home after parental leave, after 16 months, you will be given no financial support whatsoever and no cultural support either. You will be asked by anybody, please send your child to daycare. And... Uh, a daycare is subsidized then by 15,000 euros per year and per child. And if you have your children at home, you get zero on, on a national level. There are some local governments who offer a small allowance, but that's not on a national level. So one can say, in effect, that it's, it's, it's semi-compulsory in that sense. And, and you have to be a strong parent if you are not going to do that. If you get reported to the social authorities and you say that I've had my children at home, that's going to be counting as a minus on you. And in the court case of Dominic Johansson, who was taken custody two years, three years ago for, for homeschooling, in the verdict they actually said that the boy might have been damaged because he had not gone to preschool. 
So the, 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 the is very strong on this. Sure, parents are right, but children also are right, and so the child has a right to go to daycare. No. So it's twisting the whole thing around in a way which is actually based on a, a deep lack of knowledge on what children need to develop. And from one, two, or three years of age, I mean, they need loving parents. They do not need teachers. I mean, that's something that even Swedish psychiatrists are, are in agreement about. How can homeschoolers and homeschooling associations support you? I think what we recommend people to do in other countries is to write a letter or a mail to the Swedish embassy in their country and protest and say that we find this unacceptable and write polite letters, write nice letters. The person you're writing to are not the ones making the decisions, but if you write to the Swedish embassy, they will forward that information to the Swedish government. So the most effective way is to write to the Swedish embassy in your country. You can find it on the net. Thank you. Um, in Ireland, home educators interpret the Constitution as giving them an inalienable right to home educate. The law says that the family should register with the NEWB. This is the State Department that deals with truancy, among other things. Uh, some of us oppose the assessment of the registration process. What are your thoughts on assessment or registration uh, with the government when you want to homeschool? Well, I think most homeschoolers, they would like to be trusted and not have to do either of those things. I think it's, it's sort of a cultural compromise between the political culture of the country, what can be acceptable. And uh, I think the problem with assessing homeschooling is that the, the form of assessments done for school are made for school pedagogics. They're not made for the way one, one trains in homeschooling. So what you would actually need if you're going to do assessment, I would suggest that one needs to have specially trained people who understand home education, understand home educational methods, and find good ways to assess home education, not making it equal to school education. I think that would be the important things. Then what I understand, if I'm not mistaken, is that in, in some parts of the world one has stopped assessing home education because the results are so good. One doesn't see that there's actually a need for it. And what I also understand is that the, the, the fear of, of the social, socially marginalized families who are incapable of teaching their children is not that big because what I've, what I've understood is, is that in many parts of the world, those families are already known to the authorities before school age so that one knows about that. So I think, you know, I think one needs to work to create an acceptable situation. And I think the important thing here is is uh, that the government is comfortable with you home educating and that you fight for an understanding that, listen, this is not school, this is home education, this is, this is another means of educating, and you have to assess it in different ways in order for us to feel supported in doing this. And I do believe that that's going to be developed because I believe that school is, in a sense, a very marginal historical event that we've had for 150 years. And I mean, before that, there was homeschooling, and we can see homeschooling coming back again. School was basically an invention for industrial society. And we have now left industrial society. We need individuals who are more creative, have higher integrity, are more mature. And it seems like, in many cases, homeschooling is one of the ways to achieve that. And school does not always achieve that. So I think in the near future, we are going to see many different educational alternatives where homeschooling is one of them. And you know, in 50, 60 years, we may see totally different things. But I, I am convinced that they will be attachment-based, they will be based on family, they will be based on par parental connection with the children. Finally, you mentioned attachment there, and soon you'll be giving a talk here at the Le Leche League conference regarding attachment, uh, attachment theory. Do you think attachment theory is compatible with the standard school system, the industrialized system that you just described? No, I think this is in a way the big conflict because the industrial system has brought out behaviorism and learning theory as ways to, to, to view education. And what has come since John Bowlby and now with the 
more modern interpretation of, of uh, Dr. Gordon Neufeld from Canada is, of course, that solving the problems that exist in school today requires another theory, and that requires developmental psychology attachment theory, which has been confirmed by modern neurobiology. So I think this is a big paradigm shift we are seeing here, and homeschooling is just one part of this big paradigm shift where we're going from an industrialized-based kind of schooling to a more actually human attachment-based form of schooling, which accepts that human beings are human beings, and human beings are beings of attachment. They are not mechanical machines. And I just think there's no way the industrial view on education is going to survive. That's great. Thank you very much, Jonas Hemmerstrand. You're welcome. Thank you.